Hi there. Autonomous haulage, dozing, and drilling are becoming mature parts of the mining operation. It's interesting that communications infrastructure and architecture is still evolving so much in that area. In 2022, Bruce Frederick presented a new Cisco validated design for above ground mining. And so this year, I asked him how that's going. My conversation with Bruce also includes a few mining stories, thoughts on the current state of wireless and mining, and a recap of the Cisco validated designs. Here's my talk with Bruce. I'm curious on a little tidbit of trivia. What's the deepest mine you've ever been in? What's that like? Um, Henderson in, in Colorado, it's over, uh, over a mile down. So you start up at the, the top at, near the Eisenhower Tunnel in, in Colorado near Denver. Okay. And you start off at around 10,000 feet elevation, and the bottom of the mine is around 4,600 feet. Wow. Wow, that's quite yeah, a ways down. And, and the mine is so large tunnel-wise that uh, the Eisenhower Tunnel goes across the Continental Divide. And so you're on the Denver side of the Continental Divide when you go into the Henderson Mine, and all the ore comes out on the opposite side, on the Breckenridge side of the Continental Divide. No kidding. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what do they mine for there? Pardon my ignorance. That one is uh, copper and uh, molybdenum, but mostly molybdenum is the, the number one product out of there okay okay um so does it get pretty hot down towards the bottom of that or is no not, not that really one. an that, issue there that that one's not a hot mine so here in arizona out by uh miami arizona there's a uh a mine called the magma mine and that one's a hot mine so you know just uh, on that one just probably close to a quarter mile uh deep it's it's very hot it's a very wow, hot mine. okay. So that has a lot more to do with geology than it does just how deep down you are. Yeah, yeah and yeah. so like the uh, the PTFI underground mine in Indonesia, uh, because there's so much rain, it's in a tropical rainforest. Yeah. Dewatering de -watering the underground mine is, is huge. So you'll see in the tunnels that go down, on each side of the tunnels, there's these concrete uh, rivers that bring the water wow. back out. There's so much water that the PTFI mine, the Indonesian mine, has a uh, an open pit and it's tied to the underground also. And the open pit is over a mile deep. But what they've done is that they channel the water out of the underground mine into the open pit. And at the very bottom of the open pit, they've uh, they've channeled a tunnel all the way out of the mountain to the side where it comes out the other side of the mountain. No kidding. Just a big yeah. aqueduct. Yeah, because it, it, you know, it rains an average about uh, 356 days a year in, in PTFI. That's pretty much all of them. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like uh, wow. in, in Arizona, we, we average, I think it was somewhere around 20-some inches of rain a year, and they average that in less than a week. <laughs> yeah, so mining's very different depending on where you are, right? Yeah, one of the things that, that's super interesting about the, the Indonesia mine is that the mine itself starts at over 6,000 foot elevation. And so just putting in like speaker systems, the diaphragms at that, at that altitude for like an early warning system, an alarm system, they blow out if you don't get special ones that are created for high altitude. Really? Yeah, these and, are things but, that we never even thought about. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. The other well, thing that's super let's, is yeah, you're ahead. up in a, a very dry climate. You've probably been to some some places up in Banff and stuff like that to where yeah. you know you get some good elevation and you can really feel it. And most of that is caused by dehydration. So in Indonesia, working at that elevation, most people have no problem. I've I've taken people that worked in Indonesia at ten thousand feet elevation constantly, every day, seven days a week, brought them to Colorado and they ended up getting altitude sickness. No kidding. So it's not just yeah. about elevation. Okay. It's not just about elevation. It's about dehydration at that elevation. No kidding. Wow. So you've uh, you've obviously experienced mining all over the world, um, both uh, in your time at Cisco and in previous roles that you've had in the industry. Um, 
obviously uh, autonomous operation has really only been around maybe for the last 10, 15 years or so. At least, um, at least at scale beyond just kind of process control, right? Um, tell me a little bit about kind of where, uh, what the state of autonomous operation is like. How would you characterize that in terms of how pervasive it is? And uh, we hear, I guess, yeah, let's start there. Okay, so one of the things to, to consider is that where, where autonomy and, and tele-remote came from. And, you know, the whole idea was it was a truck operator being able to pull up to a, a bin and be able to load his own truck. So there would be a little dozer. He would pull up to the bin and use a, a joystick to use the loader to load his own truck. Then he would have to get really? out of his truck, change operation. And so you can see from the design of that how the – PLCs communicate on a layer two because it was always from the origination. It was always designed for like a one-to-one. -one. one truck goes to one doser, and then they move back and forth. And so you can see that this has been one of the major changes in the last probably five years is trying to get around this one-to-one -one archaic protocol stuff with Profinet, with, you know, all the other different protocols and trying to get to a TCP IP stack. And so now we see some of the more cutting edge uh, autonomy and tunnel remote allowing full autonomy on the, the loaders, the dozers, the rubber tire muckers, the trucks, but then also allowing a chair, uh, an external chair, in case something goes wrong or you want to do a tunnel remote loading to be able to control more than one piece of equipment. So this is a major shift in the idea of this idea of a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, if you have, you know, you have dozers, what you could do with dozers is you could get a dozer into a pattern to move ore back and forth, and all it's doing is going back and forth. And then that operator inside the chair could flip to another dozer and go get that dozer to go on to another track. And then once it's going on its, its standard run, it could go back to another dozer. Or if it's moving from, like, uh, a drift where the ore comes out underground to a grizzly so it could drop it down a chute to a truck below it, then all it's doing is pulling it out and moving it over and the operator can move to another one while it's running that predetermined route. <clears throat> and so he can maintain, you know, typically four, four plus different dozers off of one wow. operator now. So, you know, not only is that, you know, a ratio increase, uh, but also, you know, the, the safety that we talked about a little while ago is, is major off of it. Yeah. So see that. And then we also see where the other major change has occurred is an autonomous haulage. So right. autonomous haulage above ground has probably made the most um, technological advances off of it because what they've done is they put the intelligence at the edge. They put it out with the vehicles. So as if you look at a tele-remote for a dozer or a drill, you're still looking at 10 to 15 meg of data per minute across uh, per con connection <clears throat> across the connection back. But when you look at a, an autonomous haul truck, you're like 700K, less than one meg needed, because all the intelligence is being done on the truck itself. So the oh, truck really? has got the GPS of itself. It's got the everyone around it inside the AOZ, the Autonomous Operation Zone, and it's doing edge intelligence off of it. And the only time you have user intervention is when something goes wrong hmm. on autonomous knowledge. Right. So what we see now, Underground has already made the switch to having this idea of autonomous haulage as it arrives to a loader to do an automatic load. Above ground is still, for the most part, still either tele-remote loading or manual loading. So, you know, if you have a shovel, you usually have a shovel operator on the shovel that's loading the truck. The truck doesn't have a driver in it. Right. He's still loading the truck from there. Whereas when you see underground, we're seeing a lot of the uh, equipment being able to do an auto-arrive and an auto load without an operator intervention. Interesting. And so that's, you know, uh, we, we think that's going to shift to the above ground as as more and more. Obviously, right. below ground when you're when you're into a, a drift, you're a little bit more confined on where you can pull stuff. You're pulling it out of a chute. You're dropping it into a, a, a truck. You know. Hmm. So most uh, most vehicles or pieces of equipment that we call autonomous are probably more 
accurately should be called semi-autonomous, right? I mean, they, they might be autonomous for part of their operation, but then there's usually some kind of intervention or assistance in terms of parts of the operation, right? Um, That's quite possible. Yeah. Is that is that also the case for drilling? I mean, they talk about autonomous drilling, too. Most definitely. Uh, autonomous drilling is probably semi-autonomy at best, because you okay. have, you know, the the operator is going to align the drill up with uh, camera alignments and get it into place. Once he gets it into place, then then it can go into autonomous mode, right? Okay. So, but like typically, the the lining of the drill head is done from a, a, a tele remote off of it. Okay, interesting. Now, so, I would say that uh, there are some companies underground that have done some really nice full autonomy. Uh, okay. Where they, you know, they can load it, they can bring it around, they can bring it to the crusher, everything off of it. And the only time that the operator gets involved is if there is a user intervention needed. Okay. One more question about the technology, and then I want to get into the communication side of it a little bit, right? Because uh, that's kind of what we're here to talk about to some degree. Okay. Um, the it, I know in, in the past, a lot of the conversations we've had around autonomy have been driven by the OEM. So Cater if you're buying Caterpillars, you go with Cat Command. If you're doing, uh, you know, Komatsu, then you'd uh, uh, you'd go uh, Forerunner or whatever their autonomous uh, system is, right? Um, but we're seeing more and more third party. Like, is, is the mix starting to shift to more towards third party or is, like, how, how would you see that? I think on the autonomy side, I think that when customers are bringing in new equipment, they're going with the OEM stuff. So if they're doing Sandvik, okay. they're doing Automine or Optimine. If they're bringing in Caterpillar, then they're you know doing the Cat Command. If they're bringing in uh, Komatsu, they're doing you know modular mining with the, uh, right. the front runner off of it. Um, but I think that when they're retrofitting, when they have trucks that were not uh, set up for coming out. I think that's where we're seeing like the jigsaws and we're seeing other third party ones coming into it. Okay. And I think that's because if you're buying a new vehicle and it has the, you know, the OEM equipment on it, it doesn't make much sense to put another system on top of that. But if right. you're out there without it, maybe it becomes cost effective to do it. And one of the other things, uh, points that I want to, I want to bring up is that the shift in the landscape to do more renewable energy is also going to play a big part in autonomy. Right. Let me explain. Um, right now, above ground, we're using trucks that do 260 to 400 tons of ore in a truck bed. Right. These are very difficult vehicles to electrify, to, to go, you know, uh, electrification off of it. Now, underground, when you're dealing with a truck that's pulling 40, 40 tons, 20 tons, that's a much lighter duty vehicle to be able to electrify. We're seeing the idea is above ground. If we're going to be able to make autonomy, and I don't need operators, why not have 10 vehicles that are electrified that are pulling 25 tons, 40 tons each, instead of one vehicle that's pulling 460 tons? Right. So we're seeing this idea of swarms. And yeah. uh, autonomy is going to play a huge part because think about what that has to do off of it is – I no longer am looking at a fleet of 100 trucks. I'm looking at a fleet of, you know, maybe a thousand trucks now. And so this yeah, so that changes next, the game. Yeah, and this brings your next question: is the technology then? How do you right. support that amount of bandwidth off of it? And so those are the yeah. Questions let's that talk about that a bit, right? Because the last probably two, three, four years, there's been a lot, a lot of hype around. Uh, 5G, but even before that, you had you were starting to see LTE really get a foothold, and especially above ground mining, not so much uh, underground, but um, for autonomy. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Is that working? Um, and do you think that's that's going to be the main technology going forward? What else are we looking at technology wise? You know, I, I think that there's a good mix right now between LTE, Wi-Fi, and then also Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul. But uh, I think that each one starts to play a part in there. A lot of our major mining customers, when we met with, uh, with them at the Mining Summit in Australia, they talked about their vision was to be able to have their vehicle work on Wi-Fi, uh, LTE, 5G, or CURB 
off okay, of one interesting. year. And so the idea behind that for them was if they were doing a long haul, then they would have the capability of going over to an LTE 5G, you know, probably LTE for a much longer range off of it. It would be a lower throughput because they're on a truck. They don't need the, the bandwidth off of it. But then as they start to move into the crush convey area there where the loaders are at, and now they're getting into more of a congested area, then maybe they shift over to Wi-Fi to be able to find the spectrum that they need to be able to get the bandwidth that they're looking for off of it. Okay, interesting. And so there's a lot That's... of technology questions that exist around that too, right? Like how do you do a make before break? How do you figure out, you know, the the idea of where these shifts between that technology and that wireless come in. So it's not just a matter of even finding the right technology that can do that within the technology. You're actually saying that now even between the technologies, you want to think about that make before break idea. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay. Now, so, just know, to the, be idea is that, the idea is that, you know, we can look at maybe doing a, uh, a duplication off of it and then dedupe, right? So, if I know your GPS position of your truck and I know you're coming off of a long haul and now you're hitting into more of a congested area, before you get to that full congested area, maybe I make a, and once again, I'm saying maybe because, right, we haven't got this all worked out into a, a fully right. deployed system, but maybe you make a connection on the Wi-Fi while you still have an LTE or 5G connection and then your packets are sent out over dual paths and then once you've made your full connection on Wi-Fi, then maybe you terminate the, the LTE or, or 5G connection there. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> so, so, the, so to be clear, um, when, when we talk about you, just maybe tell, tell the audience kind of what you do from a validation and, and design perspective, because that's going to play into this in a second here. Um, it, that's basically been a primary part of your role over the last however many years is this validation of designs for autonomy and obviously other use cases as well. Um, so maybe talk to us a little bit about that, what kind of validated designs we have, you, you've created already for reference points. And I don't think, you know, maybe you're working right now on this kind of multi-wireless type of design with make before break, all that stuff. That's really, really cool and interesting emerging stuff. I don't think you have a validated design for that yet, if I, I imagine. Talk to us a little Not bit yet. about that continuum and what we've got so yeah. far. So, so we made a reference um, validated design. We used our industrial automation, and we brought that in. So this one is designed to be able to look at how the mine site is set up to the Purdue model off of it so we can look at where crush convey, where process control sits, where haulage sits, where the IDMZ is at, how SD-WAN can play into that so that we could connect to a, uh, a remote operation center or we could connect back to our, our data center or we could connect out to Azure for a data lake off of it. And so the idea there was how do we set up our reference so that we can see how routing, switching, wireless, uh, SD-WAN, firewalls all play into place and be able to give our site survivability plus give us the option of doing a remote operation center or being fully on site. Uh, so that's mining 1.0. That's our reference to start off with. Okay. Then, then we did a, uh, a mining 1.5, which was a, a low, below ground with Sandvik as our partner. And this one does full autonomy with Sandvik. So it works both uh, semi-autonomous, it works with digital dispatch or fleet management system, and it works full autonomy. And the idea is that uh, Sandvik has a system called OptiMine, which optimizes the mine. And then they have an AutoMine, which is an automatic uh, automation system off of it. Um, prior to that, we had validated with Caterpillar in the Wi-Fi spectrum above ground for the IW3702 and the 1572s. Then we did all IW3702s Wi-Fi underground with Sandvik. And then we purchased uh, Fluid Mesh and rebranded them to Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul. And we went back and validated that design with Caterpillar with the FM 4500s for above ground. So it gave us the capability of both either Wi-Fi or Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul validated above ground and Wi-Fi validated below ground and a reference model for the, the mine site across the, the different areas of it. 
And so all of this is in 1.5? No, so it's broken up. 1.0 one has okay. the, uh, the, then the we've reference. Got, uh, yeah, then we've got 1.5, and then we have 2.0, which has got the Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul for Caterpillar. Okay. All right. So anyway, so all three of these are valid still today, and they have different parts of the solution depending on what your mine site looks like. Is that fair? That's correct. Okay, and then, cool. uh, like like we were talking about earlier, we've been working on validating with the uh, with the IR to be able to get both LTE or Wi-Fi or 5G and Wi-5. We've also been working with partners to get the ESR 6300, the embedded router, and then get a either LTE or 5G PIM plus Wi-Fi capabilities off of that too. Um, okay, to that would be with a partner. Uh, a partner the, the of Cisco, I, then, right? Yeah, the IR is uh, with using like the IR eighteen hundred, and then right. getting an enclosure to be able to get that so it can pass the vibration and temperature testing that it needs. It. So we already have we've already been working with partners to get the vibration testing and the oven testing for the temperature, and we've gotten both of those where we're successfully past those those hurdles. On the IR eighteen hundred. That's correct. Wow. Okay. So talk to me a little bit about that because there's been a, a lot of discussion about kind of what devices work on what types of equipment, right? And and that can be a little bit of a, a, a difficult kind of maze of, of different um, yeah. options, right? So what you're saying is that um, uh, basically any light duty uh, or medium duty even is relatively easy. Uh, but when you get into the heavy duty stuff, that's when like the dozers and the haul, you know heavy haul trucks and and some of the ones that have a lot more vibration requirement, right? Um, you're saying we even have equipment there beyond just the Wi-Fi because I know we used to primarily be able to deploy Wi-Fi there, but not so much LTE um, curb. I guess we could as well, right? So it was maybe just more or less the LTE part. Is that fair? Yeah, and so so that that is with an enclosure, with a third party enclosure. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. So not just. And then the other hardware. option you talked about was that the the ESR with a partner hardware, so, um, uh, and that's not out yet, right? That is not out yet. No, but we are in the process of getting the POC with partners off of the the ESR. Okay. okay. And so, you know, so stay tuned for that, that. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. Most definitely. That that should hopefully be this year and. Uh, the idea off of that is that, you know, being able to do a VX overlay off the top of it and then bring that across. So that's another good question. Like the, with the autonomous software, a lot of the autonomous software is very layer two centric, right? So when you do your validation testing, do you do you actually run those layer two protocols and the VX LAN encapsulation and all of that over top of the validation? 100%. So... What okay. we'll do in the, the validated design is that we get with whichever partner that we're working with, whether it's Sandvik, Caterpillar, Atlas Copco, um, you know, EpiRock, uh, we get with them and we find out exactly what protocols they're using, which jitter they're using, whether they have a test, uh, test suitcase that we can borrow, and then we bring that into Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, we test across that. And we come up with the, the configuration needed, everything else needed. And then we go on site to the customer or to the partner's proving grounds, whether that's, you know, okay. Peoria and, and Saharita for, for Caterpillar or into Finland for uh, Sandvik. And then we test with their actual equipment, with their actual configuration, with their actual application. And then we go from there to a customer site. So it's, okay. it's a three step process to make sure we work out the majority of the bugs that we can in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, then go on to the partner site test it again there, and then go to a customer site and get the final test there to make sure that as okay. we go down the road. So then after that's all done and we're published, from there, you know, the customers can now have full confidence that they're not doing a proof of concept. The proof of concept is already done. Now they're doing a proof of value. They're, they're deciding, does this solution bring value to their company? If it does, and if, if they configure it in which it is, is very documented, they know it's going to work. Very good. Okay, cool. And so, one so of, one of the things we're working on right now is the new access point, the 9167. And we're going to do the 9167 in both Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless backhaul mode, and we're also going to do it in Wi Fi mode. 
Okay. And then we're also going to bring into it the new 9165. The idea behind the 9165 is for every piece of heavy-duty equipment inside an AOZ, it's roughly five pieces of light-duty equipment. And anybody, oh, interesting. Or any, okay. piece of, any piece of equipment inside an, an, an opera, uh, autonomous operation zone needs to be on the network so it knows where everything is at. So light-duty right. vehicles could easily deploy a 9165. They could also deploy a 9167. No, no big deal either way. But if you're looking at, you know, shrinking the size down very much smaller and, and everything else, is another option that we're looking at off of it. Okay. Uh, so, so you've been busy. Is, yeah. We have. We have. And we're, um, we're uh, getting to the point where we're getting close to getting our our first testing for the 9167 has already been done. We're already working with Caterpillar for above ground right now. And then we're hoping to be able to get both Caterpillar above ground, 9167 running the Wi-Fi in the Catalyst 9800 controller, uh, the 9167 in Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul, and then we're also working forward to getting the 9167 on the Catalyst 9800 controller for below ground running Profinet across it at layer two levels. Wow, okay. So lots of really kind of cutting edge stuff going on that that people have been kind of asking about here and there, um, and some uh, some that have have been uh, trying to make something work, and now they hear that you're actually all, already testing it. So this is good. So if you are you know just for the people listening out there, um, if you're one of those customers that's been banging your head on something that's not quite working the way you expected it to. Um, you know, maybe we can connect the dots here, right? And say, like, Bruce, how how did you handle this, right? Because you've done a lot of this testing already. Um, yeah. Let's um, let's go back for a second. So last year, when we when we met at this virtual mining summit, um, you were just kind of explaining what was in this 2.0 above ground curb, um, and there wasn't really a lot of mines that had pervasive curb. I don't know if there was any. I know there was lots of proof of concepts out there and small pilots, but in terms of pervasive deployments, I know some of that has changed in the last year. Can you talk maybe about a couple of examples of where we've seen a lot of growth in terms of uh, the number of curb um, infrastructure nodes in a mine kind of grow into a, a more mature state? Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? I, I think we're still seeing, you know, smaller deployments right now in the curve stuff. Okay. I think that m the majority of our customers have been waiting for the the 9167 to come out. I think okay. that you know we do have we do have a couple that have put in, you know, that are in the process of putting in, you know, multiple hundreds of uh, pieces of equipment on the the curb. Uh, but I think for the most part, customers have been either limping along with the uh, 1572s and the IW3702s and, right. and wanting to find a solution to come across to the curb off the 9167. And one of the okay. great advantages that you can see off of that is that because the 9167 can operate in either uh, 802.11 mode or in Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul mode, what you could do is you could expand your current deployment in Wi-Fi using the 9167 right. in Wi-Fi mode. And once you have enough critical infrastructure and equipment loaded off of it, then you could do a maintenance window and flip the switch and take your AOZ and move it into a protected uh, Cisco Ultra Reliable wireless backhaul mode. Okay. Interesting. Now, one of the things, so you, one of the things that's super important to remember is that the access points themselves operate in either 802.11 or Cisco Ultra Reliable. So if you still want to do digital forms, everything else, then you need to have another set of nodes to be able to do 802 at 11, which is very similar to how a lot of uh, autonomous operation are, are running right now. The idea is that because the, the autonomous operation is my high value unit, when you put it over to a curb mode, you put it on a protected mode, the only thing that can connect to it is other curb radios. Right. And so then if I want to have digital digital signage for, you know, sign off, or I want to do a pre-check or, or any other kind of stuff, then I put access points in those areas where I want to have Wi-Fi also. Okay. Now, would would uh, most operators, would they hang that Wi-Fi off of the curb backbone, or would they uh, would there be actually separate infrastructure, backhaul infrastructure? N they, they would hang it off of the same one. 
the same. So you know you have it. You have a trailer there. You just either put a switch off of it and then connect the, the Wi-Fi one back through that. Now, keep in mind that one of the advantages that the ninety-one sixty-seven has is that because it now has two five gig radios, one five gig radio, one five slash six gig radio, you could use one dedicated radio for point to multipoint or ingress and one for egress off of it, right? Okay. So now we no longer we no longer have to do a single radio design where remember wireless is a, a half duplex media, right? So right. only one person can talk at any given time. But if I have two different frequencies, if I have my point to point coming in on frequency one, and I'm talking to my mobile endpoints on the, the haul trucks on frequency two, they could both be talking at the same time. Okay. Okay. So that's um, that's kind of how you see that evolving. Um, obviously, lots of people are waiting for the 9167. So um, I guess shipping that in volume is going to be is going to be a huge thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely working with the customers and trying to find out, you know, who needs what quantity and when they need them. Uh, obviously, you know, if uh, if customer one wants to get 5,000 9167s, but they're going to deploy it over the next 36 months, they don't need 5,000 today. You know? right. So the idea is to work work with our customers, work with our teams, because everybody knows that supply chain issues exist across the world right now. That's just that everybody's dealing with supply chain issues, right? Right. So if if you need, you know, if a customer needs... 5,000 units over the next 36 months, how many do they need in the first six months? And then how, how do we right. meet those those needs so that we can have customer A, B, and C all be able to have successful deployments off of it okay. and not impact their deployment line either, right? Right. Okay. Cool. So we are seeing that that is already happening in terms of um, uh, I mean, we can we're we're shipping them as fast as we can make them, I guess is what it boils down to. That's correct. Okay, cool. Um, well, you've you've uh, you, you've put a lot out there. Um, I'm just trying to think of how we um, how we kind of wrap this up and summarize it because there's a lot of information there. I guess first of all, I, I would encourage anyone who's kind of mulling over kind of where is this technology going, and um, what I'm hearing differently from you than I am from other people in the industry is is that there isn't necessarily one technology that will hit almost everything, right? What you're saying is that the people who are, are furthest along in this have really completely recognized that they're going to need multiple wireless technologies. In fact, you're even going as far as saying we're going to need multiple wireless technologies on a truck, right, on one endpoint, and they're going to want to move from one domain into another. Um, at that point, it becomes pretty important that all of that is managed in one infrastructure. Um, yeah. it, how much of a difference does that make that to have kind of one, um, uh, you know, one plan for all of that? I think it makes a huge difference. You know, I mean, if if you start to think about it logically, it, it makes it makes sense. If if we were to look at okay, you know, five G is going to be the magic bullet that could work everywhere. And now you're in North America where there's no 5, 5G spectrum available. How are you going to use that? You yeah. know, or if you're out on a shared spectrum, or if you know because of the tower density that has to be deployed to actually get any kind of real throughput for 5G, you know, are you willing in a in a mine that's constantly changing to keep putting up towers in that 5G? Or are you looking at maybe you know using a lower throughput off of it and being able to use these mobile trailers? That are running, you know, uh, 802.11, which I can get on, you know, especially with six six gig spectrum being opened up, I can right. start to get a lot more throughput off of it and start to balance across that. And then on top of that, do I want to balance my opex and my capex? You know, do I want to be able to pay for everything up front and then operate for almost free, or do I want to have a monthly bill off of operating my wireless? Right. And these are different management decisions that are being made. They're they're technology decisions, but they're mostly management decisions on how we're going to find cost-effective ways to do that. And so right. I think that having the ability to manage that across the system is 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 uh, vital, right? And uh, yeah. and I would echo your your comments earlier. If you have a customer that's trying to figure stuff out, you know we can most definitely work with our customers. We can work around trying to figure out 
where they're at now, what kind of problems are they existing off of it. You know, we offer a huge, um, CX offers a huge uh, assistance inside the services industry inside Cisco too. And we have a very solid CX department that has done deployments both above ground, below ground, in the oil sands, in the hard rock mines. Um, and we have we have that set up too. Yeah, that's that's a really good call out. I um, I was actually just talking to a customer uh, last week that's um, that's actually using our CX services for for assessments on their uh, on their processing plants, and and I know those same people have also done uh, done assessments within the mine too, and been able to to do some architecture work there. Um, and then we also work with a lot of sort of mine specific partners as well that that really know know that business very well some of what you know some of those are are on our uh, on our mining summit call here today so um I, just a, a bit of a shout out for them um so there's there is help right it, there is, know, there is, let me let me wrap that up this. real quick into to another uh really good point i think off of it is and there's there's levels of help too so you know we we work with our partners Sometimes customers want to have, you know, the, the Cisco signature on the line too, right? Yeah. And so we, we offer everything from, you know, overall uh, oversight all the way down to, you know, actually being the people that do the deployments off of it. Yeah. But in an oversight one, maybe, you know, the customer's like, I want to have Cisco to sign off on the factory acceptance test. I want Cisco to sign off on the site acceptance test. However, my partner can do all the deployments. The partner can do all of the setup and everything else. I just want Cisco to come in and give a stamp of approval off of it. And so that's a much more oversight off of it. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, maybe the customer's like, I can't find a partner that I want to partner with. I want to partner with Cisco, and I want Cisco to run it all the way down to the nuts and bolts. Now, obviously, you know, those are huge scales off of it. But I bring that up just to make, make sure mm -hmm. that we're clear that in our CX organization, it's not a one size fits all. It's not okay. CX comes yeah. in and does really everything, or CX comes and doesn't do anything. You know, there's levels that can be done off of that. Absolutely, yeah. In some cases, we've even had partners sub to us, right? To if if the customer wants, you know, one uh, one signature on the whole thing, right? So uh, there's lots of different ways to do this. That's that's a really really good call out. So um, so maybe let's let's wrap up with this. Why? Uh, why is it that you you know that that um, why is it that mining customers keep coming back to Cisco? I guess um, to to help them with their infrastructure uh, requirements in mining. I I think there's a lot of reasons off of it, and, I, and I'll give you a couple of the top ones. Uh, you know, number the number one reason is that it is extremely difficult to get technicians to be able to go out to these remote sites and live in these remote sites. And then to expect these technicians, which is already hard to recruit, to be able to, you know, configure and troubleshoot technology A, technology B, technology C, run the fiber optic lines, you know, deal with the, the VoIP problems out there, all these other different things that are loaded on top of it. And so by whittling it down to, you know, a single vendor yeah. with support is a huge, <laughs> a huge aspect on top of that. With our tax support, with Cisco's tax support, you can get tax support in Swahili. You can get tax support in French. You can get tax support in English. You know, uh, it, it's very, very much across the system in Spanish. If you are in South America off of it, these are things that it's very difficult. And you get that 24 seven, right? The ability mm -hmm. to follow the sun off of it and get somebody that can help you troubleshoot all the way down across that. That's a huge idea, right? Most customers are looking for a single hand to shake or a single throat to choke, right? Whichever way that it, yeah. that it turns out at the moment. Uh, whereas, and there's a, yeah, I was just going to say, there's a lot of depth there, vendors, right? Yeah, if you have all these other vendors, then it's very easy. You call up and you have a problem, and they're like, oh, no, it's the other vendor's problem. No, it's this vendor's problem. And then if you yeah. look at on top of all of that, if you look at the Cisco validated design, so you've deployed a mine under a Cisco validated design running on Sandvik equipment underground and you run into a problem. Now all of a sudden, now you get the support of both Sandvik and Cisco because we validated together and TAC also has the training 
to know what's going on with, okay, I need to get help from this person or that person, and we bring it together off of it. Same thing for Caterpillar, if you're doing above ground or below ground. And we've done this for Caterpillar below ground. We're currently doing that right now with uh, a customer that's having some issues off of it, running older technology and the Caterpillar system. We're working with Caterpillar, with our TAC, and with our business unit to be able to get through, okay, how do we get from where we're at now to where we need to be at the end? So, so I'm going to ask a, a kind of a question that might be banging around in some people's heads here. If they have looked at the 1.0 kind of reference design or uh, some of the early ones, um, there might even be references to 1572 or some of these earlier APs that really we're not selling anymore. So how, how does that work with the validation process? Um, and and how, do, how do people now say, well, I can order 9167s, but they're not actually in your validated designs. What, is, what do you say to that? Yes, yeah, so the, the new validated design that we're working on will have both the 1572s and the 9167s in okay. them together to show okay. a migration path, to be able to go from where you're currently at now with the 1572s, because the 1572s will more than likely be running on 5520 controllers in Arrow. Right. And the 9167 will be running on the Catalyst 9800 in the Cat OS. Right. And so we, we've we already done the groundwork on that. We did that with the IW6300 uh, inside the oil and gas processing, which also fits into mining processing. Yeah. And we did the 1552Hs, which is running on the Air OS, and the IW6300 running on the Cat OS. And we made it where they were uh, interromable and they meet all of the timing requirements hmm. that are needed. Off. Wow. The other good part of okay. that is that we did that in the mesh mode. So we made it so that a, a 1552 uh, can connect back. I mean, I'm sorry, a 1550, yeah, a 1552 can connect back as a map to an IW6300 as a wrap or vice versa. And this okay. is super. This is a super big point because you don't want to be pigeonholed as a customer into okay. I'm going to deploy the newest technology. Oh, but it has to be deployed in this spot or that spot or this spot, and I can't deploy it there. I can't deploy. It. And if that happens to be the case, you want that very well documented. Right. So if there are gotchas, that's what our validated design does around that too. Is how do we get so that you can now retire your 1572 or your IP3702 if you're underground, that that uh, that infrastructure, how can you retire that in a graceful fashion? Right. So that you don't have to just like, you know, because nobody can shut down their mind for several days and, and do a rip and replace on everything. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah. Which also exactly. is another reason to go back around to your question of why do customers come back to Cisco is because we have that capability of doing those migration paths. Instead of saying, okay, yeah, you can deploy this and, and run two completely separate networks until you finally get it all deployed. Now, this is a single network. This is growing your network, continuing to do your daily operations off of it until you've retired your old infrastructure. Right. Wow. So it's always a pleasure talking, talking with you, Bruce. Um, uh, I know there's going to be questions that come up that we didn't cover off in this, uh, in this discussion. Um, it's... Uh, I, it, I'm really sad that you're not able to be there live, but um, I know you would have wanted to be. And uh, but we'll uh, if we don't get things answered during the the mining summit, we'll come back to you after uh, after you get back home, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll cover off uh, stuff afterwards. We will have a WebEx team space um, open for all of the attendees, and uh, and we'll get you in there to answer questions if uh, yeah. uh, since you weren't able to be there live. So. Uh, yeah, appreciate it. Love, love to answer the questions on the, the WebEx. We can set up meetings. We can do whatever you'd like to do off that. I, yeah. You know, okay. obviously the, the idea is how do we make sure that um, both our customers and Cisco are successful as, as we move forward to uh, mining, the, the mine of the future, right? Very good. Yeah, no, I, I've i uh, over and over again, I've had uh, I've had directors of, of, of OT and in mine sites uh, meet with you and come back and say, man, I, I could sit there a long time and, and talk to Bruce. Uh, you, you've got a lot of really cool insights. So if anybody hasn't met with Bruce and would like to would like to take us up on that, uh, definitely uh, we'll be open to arranging some of that. So thanks a lot, Bruce. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Bruce. For more information on Cisco and the mining industry, check out cisco.com slash go slash mining. Take care.